So if we think about it, uh, we have uh, many new disciplines coming due to the digital uh, era. We are hyper-connected. We have computers. We were not uh, having these things to Application developer or an augmented reality programmer or a performance artist that uses different kind of uh, mediums or, for example, um, an artist that plays music with his eyes. So all of these things bring us to a point to understand that we cannot be talking about uh, education in the textile and uh, new technologies without trying to define a new discipline. So probably your uh, parents, when you explain what you will be doing in this course, they will not understand because there was not a demand in their age. They, this thing did not exist. All these new jobs, they didn't exist. We have uh, many new jobs coming up due to the digital era. And this is what we formulated and we said, what is our dream? What we want to have as a dream course? And we, we made, we put together the pieces of a puzzle and we think that we are creating the new professionals that can actually um, respond to the demands of, of the fourth industrial or fifth industrial revolution. And why do we focus in textiles? We focus in textiles because it is a very big industry. So you could focus in industrial design or you could focus in architecture. You can focus in different fields. We have, the course is based on tools. You can apply these tools in various fields. And we want to tackle a specific one, which is the textile and fashion industry. Because uh, actually it has been innovative since the first industrial revolution. It was always one of the first industries to implement new, te new technologies. And also because actually it is an industry that is growing. It's growing with an exponential uh, character. Like it, it, is, uh, um, so it is predicted that we will have growth in the textile production of 5% uh, until 2021. And textiles are actually everywhere. Uh, the, what we think as clothes is only one little small part within what is the textile industry. Look around you, you can see there are technical textiles that they are using in agriculture. There are building construction textiles. There are uh, geotextiles. There are domestic textiles, all the sofas, all your curtains. There are industrial textiles. They are uh, textiles for the automotive industry, for aerospace, uh, packaging textiles, protective textiles, medical textiles, sports textiles. So it's a very, very big field. And it has been um, advancing because before uh, we, we used to produce actually one. It's not a long time ago. It is only like 100 years ago that we have been producing on a small scale in our house. In our house. Everybody was producing their um, clothes at home. So um, what we call uh, from beats, uh, bespoke tailoring, bespoke actually means to give order for something to be made. Then we move forward to the ready to wear and to the first industrial revolution. Before we were making everything at home, everybody could actually uh, produce his garments. And actually, there was a big um, societal gap because the ones that they were in a higher class, they could actually hire somebody to produce the garments. And what happens in the first industrial revolution is that we have the democratization of fashion, where we can actually respond to the demands and the needs of a growing population and um, we have um, the, actually the fact that we can industrialize in a specific location and then export and import the goods to far away distances. Actually, the textile uh, industry is also one that is thought to be the first one 
that is uh, invented the computer. It is the jacquard loom, the weaving machine, that was uh, working with punch cards that they had holes. So this is actually the base, an important step in the history of computing hardware. And nowadays we come into this. We come to the fact that we have empowered ourselves, we have grown so much science, we have developed so many tools and processes, we have made mass production possible, we can ship things everywhere in the world, and we come to play a point where we have overproduction and excess. excess. So we have 80 billion of garments produced annually, and actually the global apparel market is valued to be three trillion dollars and accounts to the 2% of the GDP, the gross domestic pro, uh, product. But at the same time, the fashion industry uh, contributes to 10% of global greenhouse emissions due to its long supply chains and uh, excess energy intensive production. We have uh, a lot of uh, shipping, like we don't know anymore how many kilometers a t-shirt has traveled before it reaches to you. So actually, before it reaches to you, it has been washed, it has been dyed, it has been shipped back, it has been sewn, uh, it has been woven. So the total journey for a t-shirt is about 32,000 kilometers, which is insane. And we estimate about 2 billion t-shirts being sold annually. And then we have what is the fast fashion. So before we, so now that we have the capacity to produce so much, we can actually, instead of having only two seasons, the winter and the summer, we have fast fashion, which implies the trends to be uh, more than six different seasons per year. And it is the concept of that before you have actually um, digested and, uh, and, and understood the idea, you have already produced. So the, fa the fashion product is already available in the market. And it is, the fast fashion is actually, it means high volume, low margin, fast paced, cheap and disposable. And it, um, it, uh, it is a lot of the digital media actually that they grow this a need of, I want to have this now, and we have forgotten how to take care of higher value uh, products. We have, we, we, we consider everything as something disposable. And actually, we talk about all these advancements and we talk about all the uh, digital technological, uh, new technologies that they are applied into fashion, but there are many flows at the same time. Not, nothing is perfect, so there is a lot of room to improve. So even the textile industry is one of the most advanced ones and pioneer in new technologies. We, it doesn't even need actually human uh, at some point because it's automated, we've done with robots and uh, for the yard processing. Still, we have uh, almost a 20% of the fabrics and the textiles that never reaches the shop because it has been badly sewn, because it has been badly painted. So imagine how big amount of textiles we throw away before even it goes to the end consumer. And uh, apart from that, we have all the patterns. So the patterns, they are not zero waste and the percentage that you have, that you are finding on the floor of the cutting rooms is around 15%. So there is a lot of, um, there is something existing that there is a lot of place for improvement and we can find ways to, okay, we have achieved to be able to produce so much. So how we can actually improve, how we can actually see all these things and make a change? Because, um, because we need to be responsible and we need to give a, a, a good answer to what we have been doing in our planet. This is not a painting, it's the chemicals actually of the fashion industry. 
we know that the pollutants released by the global textile industry are uh, continuously doing unimaginable, unimaginable harm to the environment. The fashion industry is the second most pollutant industry in water pollution due to the chemical pesticides, the textile dyeing and the treatments after the oil industry. The thing is that maybe we don't see this every day because it is done in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. And there it's their daily life and reality. Imagine that in order to produce it, only one t-shirt, you need 700 gallons of water. And then you have also uh, conditions that they are not uh, the best. We have child labor, we have a very bad working conditions for the textile industry. This is a, a big uh, incident that happened in 2013 that many um, non-profit organization raised the awareness uh, it was um, due to the bad installation uh, in the factory. The, the whole factory went on fire and it killed more, 1, 000, more than 1,000 people. And it's not only that. Nowadays, we have the cotton, in the, the cotton crop that is talking a lot of water. It's like the mo it needs tons and like gallons of water. But it's also that 90% of it is genetically modified. They claim that the genetically modified crops, they are saving lots of energy, but we should not also forget that these developments are only happening the last 20 years. And we have been doing otherwise before. So we shouldn't be only like techno lovers. We should also be aware of what has happened uh, before and and how we can actually work together in a cycle with nature. Sometimes you see that nothing changed. Sometimes you see, for example, this factory, and you see that in uh, 100 years ago, yarn spinning was like that, and then 100 years later, it's kind of almost the same setup. And then you say, why? Why they didn't imagine so much? They didn't imagine how the future would be. Maybe they have imagined the future actually in, uh, maybe they have imagined the future, but maybe they didn't take into consideration all the bad aspects that the textile industry has. And they were only trying to serve a demand of the population that was needing more and more clothes. So we need to reflect on that. And we also need to imagine more. We need to create new stories that they can actually bring, bring us to the future. Whatever you imagine, it will happen. So if you are actually seeing a future as it is prescribed, for example, in Black Mirror, then it will happen. If you don't want this to happen, then you need to dream otherwise. What science fiction literature prescribed back in the 60s what futuristic cinematography provided in its visual imaginary and visionary researches pushed forward to the work of the future is this kind of integration of technology with the human body. We have the phone. It's our extension of our hands, actually. You see people on the street walking and talking on the air. These things have been prescribed, actually, in science fiction. All of these things, they have been written and, and, and taught. So beware of what you wish and um, beware because this, uh, for example, is some kind of uh, apparatus uh, invented for being able to watch television or change television. Now we have the augmented reality glass. Or we also have uh, pieces that they help for assistive technology. So we have prosthetic arms, we have prosthetic limbs, we have, we try to be inclusive in our design. All of these things are happening. They are happening nowadays. Augmented reality, new senses for our bodies, we expand our senses, we can feel the earthquake that is happening anywhere in the world, we can feel the magnetic field, we can actually uh, implement uh, senses that other creatures have, robotic manufacturing, smart cities, 
artificial intelligence, bionic materials are not an utopia. They are now being implemented in our societies. And there are differences between the 50s and the 60s and today because the rhythm of the evolution and technological advances is exponential according to Moore's law. So we live in very fast times. But there is also uh, another difference. While in the previous Industrial Revolution, innovation was mainly exclusive for R&D departments, universities, the state, and the military, and the medicine, nowadays that it is part of everybody. And this is the difference. This is what we want to have. We want to have access to technology so that we can actually do good. We can make projects that they are meaningful and they have an impact. And it's not only about creating an impact, but it's also about creating new aesthetics. With all of these new kind of technologies, you, would, you, you can imagine nowadays this kind of uh, 3D printed garments that you would have never imagined five years ago, but nowadays you can actually do them. So it's also like changing our aesthetics. And this is very important because fashion is very, very related to aesthetics. It is a personal statement of uh, how we expose and how we communicate ourselves with the world. And then we have uh, basically all the new technologies. And the new technologies, yes, they will come first in the military and the medical sector, for, of course. And it makes kind of sense. For example, this is a, a chip, very little chip that you can put directly on your body and it can monitor your heart. We have people that they have need of insulin, so they have some wearables that they, eat, they inject insulin every time they measure that uh, it's, uh, it's down. So uh, back Mr. Fuller, claim that you never change think by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new mo model that makes the existing model obsolete. Well, I, I, I have this quote for a long time and I have been thinking a lot about this quote because I think that it's a moment that we need to innovate. We need to actually see what the bad things are and see uh, where we want to direct the future because it's us actually that we have the power to uh, move and have a direction for the things. But at the same time, I think that we should also learn from the past. So I agree with back Mr. Fuller in that. I agree, I agree that you, we need to invent. We need to invent to uh, make something completely new. But I also believe that in order, in order to invent, you need to understand how the system is working. You need to understand um, what are the processes for the textile industry? What happens exactly so that you can actually be able to interfere and invent? At the same time, I also believe that there are um, the multidisciplinarity and the fact that you can bring people from other sectors into different places can bring actually innovation. Because maybe because of the fact that they do not know how the things work, Maybe they can invent something completely radical new and it can work. But I, I also believe that we should, when we enter in the field, I think that we should have some kind of culture and some kind of literature about the things. So yes, there are examples. There are very good examples in the textile industry that there is some kind of need and emergence to be able to solve critical problems. For example, there is this company that uh, it's uh, called Daiku. It uses uh, a gas, a, a gas chamber, and they do not use any water anymore for dyeing the fabrics. So we are talking about an industry that has been claimed to be the most polluting one, and uh, after all, the second one for water pollution. And then suddenly you have a radical technology that eliminates completely the use of water. It's not like uh, the, I'm using water and then I'm filtering and reusing it, so I am just using less water. It's that I'm eliminating completely. Unfortunately, at the moment, this kind of technology is not accessible. Or, for example, this kind of uh, future craft, uh, biofabrics, 
that uh, are woven uh, from Adidas. So this is a, like a grown fiber. It's, uh, it's designed and computed to perform in a specific way. It's 100% biodegradable and it's produced with renewable resources. So we see also that there are intentions in the textile, se textile and clothing sector to innovate, to be more sustainable, to be more circular, to be able to understand and reflect all the errors that they have been done through the years and improve. The thing is that we want this to happen everywhere. We want this to be uh, not only in the R&D department of a big company. We want to involve people. We want innovation to be happening on the streets. And we want everybody to have accessibility to this. And this is uh, what we call also the third or the fourth industrial revolution, if you want to call it, what is called the maker movement, why we are here, why we are connected with other people in the other side of the world, and what are we uh, trying to change with new paradigm. The first best example of that is the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia is actually something that is for the people, by the people. So each one can be a contributor to the Wikipedia. You can actually see projects of a person writing a translator for his home language because it's being extinct. So he uses the Wikipedia, the tran online translator, the Google translator as a tool in order to save his small uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, 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 language. So. The Maker Revolution and the FabLab Network is this. We work locally while creating communities globally. And we equalize and distribute evenness between developed and undeveloped countries. And we distribute also evenness between small enterprises and big companies. Digital fabrication actually <coughs> allows us to investigate, teach, and practice in an integral way. And we can talk about on-demand production, which means that I don't need to have stock anymore. I don't need to produce in advance. I can produce on demand. We can talk about customization. We can talk about the actually the, the same person being able to interfere in something in this object and actually personalize it. We, we talk about small factories, small scale production, local material flows, so you can activate an economy in a local level. And we also talk about combining the physical, the making, and the digital. If you are doing something completely algorithmic, parametric, with computation in 3D, in the end, you need to put the love of your hands and the craftsmanship in order to have something that is valuable. It's always together, the physical and the digital. So Fab Labs actually, they have uh, shared the same tools. So you will get a training that it will allow you to travel anywhere in the world and be able to use a space that has exactly the same tools. So you can go anywhere and be ready to, to continue working. And not only that, you will see that your work can be actually produced on site. So, for example, you have your digital file and for your exhibition, and then you travel uh, to Brazil and you just produce your digital file there. So you don't need to ship your pieces. The principle of uh, Fab Lab in a nutshell is to empower the people of the world through the ability to make things. The course mainly uh, that is run from uh, the founder of the Fab Labs, Neil Gershenfeld, is called How to Make Almost Anything. So you learn to make electronics, you learn to document, you learn to publish, you learn to fabricate, you learn to program. So this started in 2001. Uh, it's been uh, 18 years. Yeah, 18 years. So Im we also imagine that now the Fab Lab Network is in a moment of having passed from a teenager to an adult. And also, we also think that with this program, 
we, we have a different perspective in order to be able to reflect also and improve the things that we have been doing all along. In the end, this program, uh, it's uh, run uh, by the, the Fab Academy, is a program run by Neil Gersefer, which is the founder of Fab Lab, of the Fab Labs. And what he wanted to do is that he wanted to have a global impact because he can teach in the MIT to a thousand people, but now he has reached to a billion. So it's very different impact. You can find the platform there are more than 1,600 fab labs. So imagine that in 2010, when uh, I arrived in Pablo Barcelona, they were around 500. Imagine the exponential growth, how it's happening. So we think it's something that it should be in any school, in any library. Actually, the fab lab is the new library it's the making library and and in barcelona there are public fab labs that they serve for that it's like a civic center so in, in barcelona it makes a lot of sense uh, to do this and um, i started uh, uh, with uh, the fab textiles lab now it's called fab textiles and materials lab uh, so in, i started in 2013 and uh, I started doing some kind of activities that uh, they included uh, textiles into digital fabrication. I didn't know what would happen. I was doing this only for my personal pleasure. But then I understood that actually there is a very, very interesting audience that they are, they are artists, they are designers, they are fashion designers. They, they don't come from such a technical background but they still really want to have an immediate uh, touch and impact with science, and they really know, want to know how uh, to make things. So Fab Textiles is a, the first textile laboratory uh, inside the Fab Lab in the world in 2013. And after that, uh, uh, and it has, uh, it has been um, Funded in, uh, co founded by me in IAC, Fabla Barcelona. And IAC is a very small independent foundation that has only master programs. We also have the Green Fab Lab. The Green Fab Lab is a uh, Valdaura self sufficient labs. We have a place in the mountains that uh, is actually working with local food production, energy production, and local zero kilometer fabrication. And the Fab Textiles is about actually open sourcing fashion production for a global innovation ecosystem. All the things that we have been doing, they have been documented since the beginning on the webpage and everybody can follow and everybody can actually read uh, through a tutorial and follow these practices. And this actually had a good impact because due to this kind of new applications of digital fabrication, we had many other fab labs, they actually wanted to uh, learn how to do this kind of processes. So for the first three years, I traveled all around the world, in Colombia, in Peru, in very, very different uh, countries. And I was teaching how you can use digital fabrication for applying it on the fashion and the textile industry. And this, uh, in this way, we create some kind of methodology. And together with the Textile Amsterdam, this methodology we solidified in what it is the Textile Academy uh, nowadays. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Thanks. So Textile Amsterdam was co-founded by uh, me and Ista Boshart about four years ago at Bach Society. And it was really the moment where we brought together and formalized all of the activities and the research that had been happening within Bach on crafts, on textiles, on sustainability. Okay, you go one back. Um, <laughs> um, because what Bach is, Bach is a research institute for art, science, and technology, where we actually look at society and the different aspects of society, and through uh, six different teams, 
we actually try to tackle what we don't agree upon and really try to understand how we can change this. And the Texta Lab does this together with the Fab Lab and the Bio Lab um, in the VAG, in the building that you saw in the picture. The Fab Lab was opened 12 years ago. The Bio Lab uh, is the first Bio Lab fully accessible to creatives and the public in the Netherlands. It uh, was opened about six, almost seven years ago, six years ago. And the Texta Lab was opened four years ago on actually September 6th. This was uh, actually possible due to a um, project that we were coordinating, where we coordinated uh, what now are 55, 56 laboratories across Europe that focus on research and innovation in textiles in all different ways. Um, and the Textile Lab here really focuses on bringing together craftsmanship and heritage techniques. My background is in fashion and in, uh, in knitwear. And I was, I was really raised with all of the crafts. I studied all of the, the much more um, traditional techniques. And somewhere along the way, fell in love with digital fabrication here at VAG. I always say one day I walked in and I never left anymore. But the Fab Lab here really gave me the space to actually start exploring this and creating a first collection fully digitally fabricated uh, in the lab using only the machines available here. Even though none of the machines available here were meant for either textiles nor fashion. So imagine taking a vinyl cutter and using it for plotting out patterns and painting on textiles with a shop pot, because these are the kind of things that we started with uh, about six years ago, to then fall in love with uh, biology when they opened the lab. And I will tell you also a bit more about that and uh, my b bacteria love. <laughs> but it is really a place where we focus uh, very much on changing the narratives in the fashion and textile industry towards good stories, towards stories where uh, cool is not who is wearing or what is the latest fashion, but is actually very much connected to craftsmanship, to knowledge, to what is the new luxury, to what is special into this clothing, and how do we craft clothing that are perfectly fitting a human body and why. Um, so it's very much a critical approach, but still filled with uh, love for this industry. Click. I think you need to click in the center. This is uh, for the ones of you that are not here. It's actually a small peek of uh, different kind of people we have in the lab because what I find always very interesting is also the combination of the three labs and all of the people that come here from scientists to chemists, engineers, and actually this all contributes very much to the click, to the environment that these labs create. And also uh, programs such as Fabric Academy really come out of these intersections. Click. The process with which we actually um, work and research in the Texta Lab is always starting from practice-based research, trying to understand what are issues in society, and we do this with peers. Click. We then always enter a phase of knowledge sharing, because everything we produce is fully documented everywhere. And actually, this allows you to create many more possibilities for collaboration. Click. To then end up in showcasing to involve a much broader public, but also really defining this alternative narratives. And one of them, click, <laughs> is what we call a new fashion and material ecology, which is also shown in the next video, if you can click. Play at the bottom. Oh, sorry guys, this is a shame. This is a beautiful video, which hopefully I will give you access to straight away. Um, and it's a video that actually focuses on bringing together uh, different points of view from artists, from creatives and researchers, showcasing Oh, it's reloading showcasing how the different points of view actually bring together a very clear new material ecology, where we look at how materials are made, uh, how digital technologies ranging from digital fabrication to AI actually have influence in the fashion material uh, and textile realms, and how actually this can come together to a completely new process, a new point of view.
I can share the video also later. Otherwise. Look at the bottom left. No. Uh, okay. Yeah. I will, I will show it later. Can... Yes. You can I don't just... know why it's not showing. But basically, uh, well, yeah, as I was saying, so in this video, all of these different perspectives were being brought together to really look at the new fashion and material ecology. Also, really starting to understand what ecology means and how we affect these ecologies, the separate ecology and the main ecology in which we live as well. So to do this, um, to shape a new material and textile ecology, we also try to design more uh, circular loops, design ecologies in a different way that are fully sustainable by becoming sustainable through design, by material, but also by the constructing. Um, so looking at circular design opportunities where the materials come from and where they will end up. How do I design with the materials that are daily? Because locally all across the world we actually have completely different type of materials. So in the next part of the presentation we will actually sort of guide you through also parts of our research agenda, like what Anastasia was mentioning earlier but also through all of these questions around materials, around the processes, and about how do we design with all of these parts. Nick? And um, first topic up for me is, of course, uh, colors. All of our color research is, for me, one of the most important parts. It's one of the parts that makes me also the happiest, um, because many of our narratives are connected to color. Color has an incredible importance in our lives daily. Everywhere we look around us, everything is colorful. And somehow, none of us is questioning where does these colors, where do these pigments come from? How is it that something that is so visible and so striking in front of us, nobody's questioning it? And um, in the first, in the slides that you were seeing before, we're actually looking at fully sustainable colors. These are local colors, most of them in your gardens or in your kitchens. And these are locally produced. They don't need to be mass produced. They don't need to come from the other side of the world. And are colors that change over time and they can be used for inks, for natural dyes, for screen printing. And they are, they are fully sustainable. And there are our heritage techniques. It's all of the knowledge that we actually have been forgetting about, we've not been paying attention to. This instead is an example project of uh, last year. Teresa did a beautiful research actually on combining uh, sleep patterns and cycles in humanity to the natural dyes in our connection to uh, our environments. This was uh, the sleep warrior. Click. But also, uh, well, you will actually be the first ones who will um, be introduced also much more to the ink side because this is the part that we're introducing this year by splitting the biochromes and the biomaterials into two parts and also looking at everything that is color around us, not only for dyeing the textiles, but also as inks, which is also the materials with which we create uh, screen printing, for example. So these colors um, are all around us. I mean. Some of those berries actually just come from the forest here next door, and they create incredible colors. This is, again, heritage techniques and knowledge that we've been forgetting about and overlooking. But click if we take one step towards... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, can I interrupt for a second? Um, I, I just wanted to also to add that the interesting point in what Cecilia is saying about the colors and about what you can locally source is that we are distributed all over the world and we are connected together. And I think that the, one of the most, the nicest I parts will get of there, Nat. <laughs> ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Sorry. It's part of the next part of the story about sharing knowledge. So, 
And this is the second part of the biochromes class about bacterial dyes. Actually, what you see here are bacteria colored in, um, uh, are fabrics colored with bacteria. It means that four years ago, I accidentally walked into the wet lab where somebody was working with uh, pigmented bacteria and actually started questioning if we could use this for textiles and started a research there. For the last four years, we have been doing research on different types of pigmented bacteria their applications, their scaling up. And we've been traveling all over the world with these bacteria, but also exchanging bacteria, and but most of all, also sharing the knowledge behind this in a fully distributed way, looking at much more the techniques and the methodologies behind this, and sharing our collaboration practices with nature, because what we're looking at here is what we call a collaboration piece between humans and bacteria. Where as a designer, you can slightly guide the process by folding the fabric, but actually the bacteria itself is creating three quarters of the beautiful patterns. And these are the textiles that were in the image before unfolded. So some of you will be also tackling this part. And the way we share knowledge is actually also through worldwide distributed events. Uh, 15 of March of uh, one and a half year ago, we actually organized the first worldwide distributed workshop where about 300 participants all over the world were actually dyeing textiles with bacteria without having it ever done before in 14 different laboratories across Europe. So this is really a way with which we try to show that it is not just about shipping, it is about the opposite. It is about looking at what is around you, looking at the bacteria that are around you, at the materials, at the dyes and actually trying to understand how you can process them. And if we share the knowledge and the techniques and the heritage and the crafts behind these, and we don't forget them, we can actually build up knowledge very fast and we can create much more larger collaborative networks to solve these kind of issues. Because the textile dyeing issue is a big issue right now. And it is an issue that has been very much overlooked for many years. Click. This is also some of the documentation, but you can go on. And actually, if you look at um, bioshades.bio, there is an entire research page where you can find uh, all of the information that has been collected on bacterial dyes in the last uh, three and a half years. Click. And then the second part of our research uh, tour that we want to take you on is bioplastics. Really thinking about crafting materials the same moment we are crafting a product, designing both together so that actually we have a material that fully fits a functionality of a product. And it's funny because many people nowadays, we see this big urge and everybody is moving towards researching material and creating material innovation solution. But many of those techniques are not new. It's just revised knowledge. And this is very important, and this loop is fundamental. That means that by keeping these traditions alive, we're actually able to um, create solutions much faster because we become much better connected in and able to share actually all of this information constantly across the world and not continue to having to translate uh, books in other languages, trying to understand how they were doing it somewhere else. So click on this research, click. We also really look at all of the different resources and all of the different sources of the material. This was a project also, uh, this is a project of Anastasia. I don't know if you wanna talk about it directly, about food waste and actually a collaboration with restaurants in their neighborhood. Maybe you want to talk about it? Yes, so basically, um... We, uh, it's very important to understand what are the materials and the sources and the energies around you in local level. And also understand that uh, due to the fact that uh, you can be connected uh, through a distributed education course, you can actually see also practices and materials that you cannot find here, but there are things that they happen in another side of the world. So we, what we did, uh, um, what we wanted to, we have been working many years uh, in uh, biomaterial uh, research, and this year what we wanted to focus mainly is how to uh, put back into a design stream um, waste, 
material that comes as a food waste. So we activated a network of restaurants around the area and we started collecting their waste. <coughs> and we said, what can we do with that? <coughs> so we defined and we uh, create three kinds of fabrication methodologies. One is to make sheets. So actually we made uh, uh, flat sheets of coffee grain and we were able to laser cut them and, and laser engraving. And we made like these uh, coffee leather bags. Uh, the other is that we create uh, molds like 3D uh, which is, um, we use uh, the peels of uh, the potato yuca, uh, which is something yeah. that they throw, but um, they, um, it, they, we made edible cups. So actually we made cups that we can eat. And the third technique is the extrusion, the 3D printing technique, where we were actually extruding eggshells. So what, how can we actually take the waste as a raw material and up, and put it in a very, very higher value because somebody's waste is your treasure. And, um, and basically uh, what we do as kind of a material activism is what, that we actually publish. We publish all these recipes that they are open and anybody can actually uh, download them, uh, read them, and everybody can learn how to make all of these things. And this is uh, very important because there have been more than like a thousand people that they have read these books and they are asking actually information about them. So what the important part is, which is what I was going to explain, is actually really sharing this knowledge and also uh, throughout the course documenting it correctly and describing it because when people are reading this online, it is very important that they also understand not only possible applications, but also all of your failures. Because actually your failures might be somebody else's solution. And we were looking, for example, well, you can click. And all of this knowledge has been collected throughout um, the last years in um, in each lab in different ways. Here in Amsterdam, we have been three years ago. We started creating this material archive, which has been uh, traveling all over the world. We've been bringing it to different exhibitions, from European space agencies to um, material ex research exhibitions, even places where we thought like this is not exactly relevant, and it always turns out to be relevant because people start to re-understand re-understand again. What is the value of materials and how do we craft fully sustainable materials, either by design, by process, or by abundance, or when we look at waste as a resource? You can click. These are more of the recipes. So to really continue looking at this loop, um, we can also involve digital technologies and digital techni fabrication techniques and work towards also what we call um, active materials. Click and two different types of projects. This is a bioplastic top uh, with activated charcoal, which has been laser cutted and therefore digitally fabricated. Click. And also um, an active material such as, okay, this is weird, um, Wear Pure, which is actually a coat that we have developed together with uh, PrimLab and uh, Nomena in Barcelona, where we're looking at actually creating both a material and a technique and a methodology. So basically this coat absorbs CO2 while you're actually walking around and living your life. That means that you as a human being doing whatever you're doing, you're purifying the air around you. On the other hand, companies that will be implementing and producing with these technologies become centers for absorption of CO2 rather than emitting only CO2. This material works with this uh, powder that actually uh, attracts the molecules of CO2 and um, splits them open and release them again as powder so that we can really clean the air around us. And the three, it's embedded in a 3D printing filament, which is uh, printed into channels. And these 
channels are actually studied based on the air flows around the body and movement. But more on 3D printing, Anastasia will be talking on more of additive manufacturing, because this is also one of the main research points on our agendas. Exactly. In uh, Actually, uh, additive manufacturing uh, could revolutionize the textile industry. We are talking, and not only the textile industry, other industries are where it's a completely new way of, of fabricating. So nowadays we also see quite a few brands that they are uh, exhibiting in fairs or even some of them they have reached the market mainly in footwear that they are uh, making uh, garments uh, or uh, accessories with additive manufacturing. Uh, in general, let's say that 3D technologies are changing the entire value chain in the apparel industry from the design and, to pro and prototyping, because it's a completely new way of designing and prototyping, to the production and the distribution. We are talking about customization. We are talking about simulation, being able to understand where are the forces that they are uh, placed. In this case, this is a project of Anna Korea from last year that she made this 3D, entirely 3D printed shoes. So it is uh, the sole 3D printed and the fabric is fabric and 3D printed on the fabric. We're talking about customization. We talk about parametric design so that she has different like uh, variable perforations in order to uh, obtain the performance that she wants according to uh, the place that the, the weight of the body is. And um, we actually have something that is more affordable and more sustainable. It is on demand. So actually we think that 3D printing can revolutionize uh, the textile industry. And we have been working on that for the last uh, seven years. Uh, we have developed uh, some kind of methodology of how you can actually apply uh, additive manufacturing in fashion. First of all, you can work a lot with accessories. Uh, you can work a lot with the footwear. We can, you can work a lot with hard parts. But then you can also uh, perform, make performance of the fabric uh, by creating chain-like uh, structures. You can uh, design elasticity through geometry, so you can make mesostructures that they are elastic because they are geometry, their patterns are like that. And you can 3D print on fabrics. Um, there are many companies nowadays that uh, they are researching and investigating in scaling up this technique. This technique has been developed mainly in, the fa in various fab labs of the world, 3D, direct 3D printing on fabrics. So uh, we will see this, in, uh, of course, because it's in our research agenda. And not only you can 3D print on them, but you can also shape them. You can form the fabric by imposing a rigid structure into something that is flexible, so it will create various form. And you can also design uh, flexibility. Yes. I wanted to say also in the previous ones on shape changing, this also completely changes the way we look at logistics. For now, the industry does need ways that it's still functioning while innovating, and one of them can actually really be working on um, printing on textiles for shape changing. Imagine shipping 200,000 um, flat shapes rather than uh, 3D constructed lamps, for example. So it really is also a way of changing the way we look at logistics, at uh, shipping much smaller materials and much smaller amounts. And we think also about uh, designing an object because when we are taught in a, a, our school like a normal uh, design process is that you want to make a garment or a cup or a computer. But we, we should move away from that. We should always think of designing systems, not products. And this you can do actually with parametric design. You can uh, create a base, you can create and input the parameters that you want. You can inform from the environment, for example, 
if it is more contaminated or less contaminated, how can this structure be adapted? And we are moving towards a, a design that I create a system and then every iteration I can make a different product. I don't think of one single product anymore. And not only uh, designing systems, but not products, but you can also design your whole process. Because if you are making actually a new material, probably this new material will need a new process. And probably it will also need a new tool to be able to use it. No? So you are designing a whole new system. And this is actually because 70% of uh, innovation happens due to material innovation. So first, normally you have material innovation and then you have the development of the tools and the development of the processes that they come in order to be able to, uh, to scale up uh, this uh, process. This, uh, for example, in the case of the bacterial dyeing, Cecilia was working many years with different like centers and different like uh, um, uh, innovation uh, spaces in order to be able to take something that is a process that happens in the lab that how can this, what kind of infrastructure would this need in order to be able to scale up? It's one place. <laughs> it's one place. It's a lab in Vienna um, led by a friend of mine who actually has a background in chemistry and is able to scale this up now. So we're looking at having a next step in the process where they are both um, they're much more chemists and microbiologists and less interested in the creative applications, but still open to that uh, discourse. And the other ones were testing labs, but they have never tried to scale up, unfortunately. So, for example, uh, in 2013, we made this gun that we could adapt to a robotic uh, hair, hair, hand and we could actually spray directly fibers on a mannequin that was rotating. So what was happening here is that we were creating a non-woven because we were spraying fibers and glue, but, but directly we were spraying it on a structure. So at the same time we were doing the material, we were doing also the garment. It was not that you have to make first the fabric and then cut out the pattern and then do the garment. It was a process that was coming all in once. So this is when we are, uh, we are saying that you can actually create your own tools that come together with your recipe and then you can create the process. Now the process is spraying around the 3D volume, for example. And there is a big research in that because we have um, actually machines and with these machines we can make new machines. So the concept of 3D printing, which is the one that is more, let's say, uh, vi that is more viral, more accessible nowadays, it can also be applied in any other kind of machine, is that with a 3D printer, you can make another 3D printer. So you can replicate. And these kind of machines, they are kind of modular, which means that you can assemble them in different ways and they can serve for other uses. And this goes towards a new era, which is the era of flexible manufacturing, which means that I don't have any more one machine that does one thing, like one machine that breaks the egg in order to make the tortilla, but I have a machine that I can adapt to it, a, a, a robotic arm that I can put on it, a tool that can cut something, that I can put a sprayer, that I can... So you have flexible manufacturing. This is not something that uh, in a normal industry you would do because the normal industry has always been focused in faster, cheaper. And nowadays, it's the moment where new technologies, they are showing into all these industries, not only new technologies, new technologies and sustainability. They are like... Uh, demonstrating to these industries that if they do not innovate, they will extinct. So, um, think about how your processes and how your systems can, be, how your designs can become systems, 
and how your processes can become something flexible and adaptable. Uh, one of our other like um, research agenda uh, is wearable technology. And we see that the, the wearable market is something that is uh, coming and the, it's foreseen to grow. And the reason is actually because our body is our, the first interface with technology. And we see also that the phone is kind of an extension of our body. So we think about how about if it was not uh, something external, something how if, uh, what about, what if it was something that it is directly on our garments? And in this case, for example, uh, we use wearable technologies for performance. Performance is one of our uh, research agenda. We think that the human uh, being can actually extend and can communicate better. And art is about communication anyways, um, through uh, new technologies. So in this case, we have a garment done uh, with uh, an artistic residences uh, within uh, Fabula Barcelona that is inspired by the Brazilian culture and it's called batuque and it's a garment that uh, dances with the sound so you see all these feathers that they actually move when there is noise when there is music so you have expressive garments and you can also create uh, your own sensors. Can you hear the noise? Uh, you could hear the noise. So in this case and uh, the previous case of the final project of Jessica from uh, Textile Lab Amsterdam, we have um, projects that they develop their own sensors. When we say sensors, it means that I am able to read something and have a variety of results. So uh, in, in the case of Jessica, we have sensor that can create sound. In this case, the previous one, in this case, uh, with an artistic residency, we have a sensor that measures the movement of the body. So we have an artist that is a dancer that can actually have some sensors that we develop here in the lab, in the class of how to make your own sensors. And when he moves, the artist, when uh, the artist moves, it can generate and trigger its own music. So we see and we consider the body as an instrument that can be a machine of creating uh, a new uh, sounds and a new performance. And the importance here is that uh, you can find these kind of sensors on the market. But what we learn here is how to be able to make our own. And this has a big difference uh, between your understanding how the sensor works and also a big difference in the in the price so you can buy a stretch or band sensors off the shelf from the market and this will cost you ten dollars you can make your own for 0 0.1 dollars so this is kind of different and not only that but you can tune it you can make it um, you can make it in the the shape that you want um, And the, the important thing is that in the context of what we are doing, you can actually iterate and reach to a point that you can have a very functional prototype. So when you're doing innovation, you need to understand that uh, the things that you are doing have never happened before. So you need to solve problems all the time. It's not that somebody will tell you, yeah, you have to do this this way because you are doing, you are creating something new. So nobody has solved the equation before. And in, in, in this kind of like context, which is a small scale, small scale micro factory where there is innovation and research in, in this kind of program that we are doing, where you have three months that you can develop your own project, 
then you can have quick iterations. Because if you're in a big company, you have to make one prototype and then it will be very difficult to go to the second iteration. But in this case, you're very flexible. You can make it, try, fix it, try. It's all the time like a continuous dialogue. So prototyping actually becomes part of a, a communication process. And, and the, the last but not least, I think it's the last but not least, is the fact that we are talking about, and one of our research agenda is also the idea of distributed manufacturing. When we are talking about distributed manufacturing, we are talking about the possibility of imagining a future, because what you imagine will happen. Imagining a future that we do not have imports and exports of products anymore, but we only send data. So we send files. So it's also uh, one of the main, let's say, um, uh, manifestos of the Fab City project, which is we are currently living in a society of data in, trash out. How we can live in a society of data in, data out. So we can exchange data, having a, a form that we can distribute the knowledge and we um, create, we generate local economies and we activate local ecosystems. This uh, is a project that is quite old. Uh, it's the first open source uh, product that we made for a bug. And then we were making this bag in ver various uh, countries and we were using local textiles. Like in Asia, we use bamboo and local fabric. In India, we use local fabric. So we have the same product that is different iterations of it because it's a different country and you can find different materials there. Um, what we do um, every year, as I mentioned before, uh, Yes, you want to uh, present the exhibition? No, fast. <laughs> okay, yes, I am finishing. Uh, what we do uh, is uh, that we actually um, have a, a global exhibition, international exhibitions, where we exhibit all the different creators. Imagine that this movement is something that is new. You will learn like that you will see that uh, you will just get to learn all the people in the community. So at this moment, you are pioneers. And uh, you will get to meet all the people and the, you will get to be able to have a smaller community. Uh, so basically what we do uh, since uh, six years now is that we organize an international exhibition. And this is actually the way that I met Cecilia back in Fab 10 when uh, I made an open call and she was exhibiting her work in the, in the first uh, uh, digital fashion and wearable exhibition. And since then we have been inviting local artists also. So the exhibition is traveling. The second year was in Boston. We uh, found various uh, people that they work with digital fabrication technologies in their work. We tackle issues like um, sustainability. We tackle issues of making like uh, digital machinery, but also uh, working with assistive technology. So in this year, we were featuring a, um, a 3D printed bionic hand that was uh, 3D printed in uh, Africa in various, pla in various uh, places for giving access to people that they don't have resources to be able to be cool because having a bionic hand nowadays is cool um, and we exhibited various designers uh, then we had the, in china uh, in chile fabricating society where we also had the uh, uh, assistive technologies and wearable competition and uh, uh, last year was in Paris, so we had also a traveling exhibition that was in Paris and then in Toulouse. And this year we had in Egypt, and next year it will be in Montreal. So um, I think that uh, this is it uh, for uh, the state of art. invitation, I think. Pub 16 at Montreal, this slide is an invitation to all of you to make very, very, very beautiful things and showcase them there.
<laughs> so start working really hard from now. <laughs> So uh, I think that the, it's uh, worth uh, um, to open a discussion. It's worth to open yeah. a discussion with the wiki. Okay, yeah, I mean, we we'll get questions and then we move forward. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, questions, I, I think also it's more like opening a little bit uh, discussion of uh, what, I mean, there is a lot of information, of course, but if you have something to reflect on or something to, uh, to contribute with, it would be nice. I have a good question. Uh, how strict you are in this course uh, to make our own PCBs? Uh, I, in textile technology or in normal PCBs? Because it's different. In textiles. So imagine, I will, I will tell you. Uh, a story. So imagine that in fi five years ago uh, or eight years ago, you would export a video uh, in uh, resolution uh, 640 by, or you would have a USB stick, you would have a USB stick that was five 112 kilobytes hmm? you, you in like technology is advancing so fast no so nowadays you have a USB stick that can be 10 gigabytes so in textile technologies we are in the 512 kilobyte at the moment we are in low resolution we are in low resolution so imagine that if you have a PCB which is in your mobile phone that is like this. Imagine that you have to make in textile technology, imagine that you have make a big drawing like that. So you open everything, you distribute everything. So it's like a big drawing. We are trying to minimize, there are many examples of spinning components into yarn, like LEDs and things like that but still we are in the 512 kilobytes. What Anastasia is gently telling you is that you will have to work with the material rather than want them to work accordingly to what you want, because the materials are not ready yet. Okay. Other questions or reflections, yes? I think something that we have uh, we might not have mentioned uh, enough also today is the fact that what we are presenting to you are not exactly solutions are possible alternatives but that while we are doing while we're exploring this path together all of us we actually also have to keep in mind that we need to stay critical and looking at all of these possibilities with a critical view because when they invented specific technologies in the past, they did not look at what the um, secondary outputs and problems that these solutions created. They thought, ha, huh, synthetic dye is amazing, but never looked at what the actual issues and the catastrophes were that they were creating. So whatever solution we are crafting together or researching and exploring, I uh, think that something that is very important and at the core also of this program is staying critical also about those and looking at examining them as possible alternatives, but uh, as we say in Italian, with a pinch of salt and realize that actually together we're crafting the future and it's full of mistakes. I have a question from here, from Paula Barcelona. Give me a second. Yeah, modular machines, yeah. 
Can he come uh, closer? Okay, he can come. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yes. You don't, don't want a translator, mediator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you do uh, get. Yeah, very good. Perfect. All right, thank you. Louder. Um, so I had a, I had a project I had to do for a DJ, um, just for a pair of shoes, and uh, I was particularly on like Nike shoes. You got like really thick, um, uh, like the really thick materials. You have like a lot of glue inside and um, uh, like heavy um, foam and so on. Uh, as, as Natasha was saying, that uh, they're like literally specific machines. You have to have to actually go through that material. Like you can't. Okay, I can do it by hand, but uh, obviously the machines are much more better for that. And uh, yeah, that's probably one solution I would do for to have a larger machine that can uh, like pierce through leather harder and that's kind of multi. You can also like change it. Um, you can set something that's accessible to home because these machines are, like so big. You have to China or so what, and then you import that tariffs, and uh, you can't install it in the house if you're a student or anything. So yeah. I guess also that your question is uh, how this kind of uh, lightweight infrastructure that we have here, how serious it can be. Because you can make things here. You can reach to get something that is almost a product. But also how, how serious it can be. Because you are saying that I have like one specific big machine that does one thing, no? And that you want something that is more versatile. Yeah, because it's like you need like you need. I think the old, the old days seemed like you need specific machines for everything. Yes. And uh, uh, it's like now with furniture, you want to have multifunctional furniture. You want to have a couch you can make it. You also sleep in it and you can make a bed. And yes. So it would be cool to take that approach with machinery. So, yeah. yeah, actually, it makes sense because uh, you have uh, a very fast, uh, so technology is advancing in an exponential way. So at some point in the first and the second industrial revolution, when they invented the telegraph and then the steam, and then they started moving the things, the coil. So basically, they said, okay, we will make some kind of industry that will last forever. So they install like this huge infrastructure. But nowadays you see that, okay, today I use this technology, but tomorrow there will be a new technology. So you cannot actually invest in something that will, with the thinking that it will last forever. You have to make something that is easy to adapt. So that's why you use the concept of flexible manufacturing nowadays in the industry that you have something that you can adapt to the things that you need. So this day I'm making shoes, but tomorrow I'm making bags. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. That flexible. Um, yeah. Yeah, flexible. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Yeah, but I don't know the mindset, no? Rather than just the machinery and the technologies of today. I mean, it's much more the explorative mindset is what we have to also hold on to. And actually I have more, how more we can questions. Cool. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna try it in English. Maybe I need your help. Yeah. I lost everybody. Yeah, you lost everybody. <laughs> oh. No. Yeah, you're back. You're back. I know, I know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's a question. It's, uh, you have said uh, that when we were, were able to produce more, we were able to want more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, how technology can improve, but not only in the material and production um, area, uh, in the um, psychological area from the people. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, most of the, of course, the, the process are really uh, harmful, yeah, but uh, Anything that we, um, so we, we need too much things. So um, I'm going to say it in Spanish and maybe you can say it. Uh, pero como, o sea, mientras sigamos necesitando tanto, yeah. siempre será insostenible, ¿no? Yeah, her, it's very nice question, actually. And it's pero for you. 
I think uh, it's sort of how I started to answer, no? It's... I will I translate, I will um, translate. I will translate that while we still uh, keep on uh, needing, needing things, things and in this velocity and you know, in this speed yeah. how, uh, como, that it's uh, going to be always it is always not going to be not, anything uh, yeah. even if you if you even if you die with plants if you need to die um or scarf uh, every two hours it's not going to be no. um it's not going to be sustainable so yeah. How all the things that we can improve here can go to materials, production, and the psychology of the humanity can go together. When we, when we look at technology, and especially at programs such as this, they're, it, they're always twofold, no? What brings us all together today is not only the need of learning all of these technologies, but also a very different mindset a mindset that is much more explorative and is actually looking at, critically looking at these stories, at the way we make things and why we need all of these things. But I also, speaking with the girls of last year, what you, what you see and what you feel is also that, yes, sure, I've learned certain specific tools, but actually the way they look at the world is very different. And this is one very important part, because no matter what technology you are addressing, Tomorrow it will be different, like Nat was saying earlier. And then what? You don't learn that. You learn a process with which you explore the world. It's an approach yeah. in which you actually look outside. You there learn to be adaptive. Yeah. You it's, learn to be adaptive. It's not only that. And this comes together, though, with when we're designing, when we're creating, it doesn't matter what it is. The stories that we're telling, the narratives that need to come with these products need to change. When you go out there now, you buy things because they are cool and you want more because the stories that society is telling us and we are transmitting constantly also to each other is that we need more. If the stories are about looking at a new luxury, looking at what is cool from a completely different point of view and getting production much closer to us again, then we also will start realizing again how long it takes to make things. Because if you know how long it takes, if you understand the whole process, you're also much more involved and much more careful with everything that happens with it. And you can see many examples of this in different cultures. For example, think in Japan on repairing garments and becoming more luxurious with time because they're telling stories or repairing with gold. And all of these links are you're telling a story and the story is not I want more and we need more and I need 600 t-shirts and all in different colors. What if you can dye with natural dyes your t-shirt and this week is yellow and next week you want it red? A little bit of turmeric from your kitchen and some soda? You have a red t-shirt. So it is the narratives that need to change and this is something that's also up to all of you, not just us. Yeah, also, like, um, I think that there is a moment of, uh, we are nowadays in a moment of being a little bit more conscious, uh, being a little bit more, uh, reflect on uh, 100 years of industrial revolution, no? So, um, I believe that uh, the first shock for a consumer is to show what it takes to be done because we don't know we don't know we go to the supermarket and everything is there we go to amazon and everything is there we don't know how the things are made and this is uh, one first let's say training like bringing consciousness uh, make at least make it clear what it takes the second thing is to be able to uh, continue the craft to be able to uh, actually train the hand. We have problems nowadays. We will lose our ability to we be able not to, these things. <laughs> to manipulate things with we the will not hand. <laughs> we need to train the, mo the body, the mind, the hand, everything. So we need to understand how things are made and we need also to make. And there is also, um, uh, like the, we are in an emergence now. Like we hear all the time about the climate change. We he, we see the 
fashion revolution we will send you some links of some interesting um, documentaries that you will see this week uh, that they are bringing all of this awareness uh, so we really believe that we have we are changing and we are not consumers anymore but we are also the people that we can produce the things for our own needs so we have the hybrid between the consumer and the producer which is called prosumer so this is the new hybrid the one that produces for his needs for his consumption is the prosumer so and and what you think is that what your question raises is actually yes if we all say here that the future will be sustainable it will be so believe it and do it yeah okay <laughs> so <laughs> okay so we, we i think we can we can do the, the lumen question would you like to stop recording and and start again no i don't think it's necessary okay Documentation and assignment. So I I will cover the documentation. So Cecilia and Anastasia explained uh, pretty well uh, our philosophy of sharing and having uh, our uh, student document their work. Uh, basically, this is your uh, first assignment. Will be to uh, create your student website and to document on it uh, uh, for this week uh, what you already know about you so your your profile your research your previous projects i will quickly show you the online resources that we have so this is the first class.textileacademy.org uh, this is uh, basically the the place where you find all the content uh, related to the class all, uh, everything is linked on this website and uh, the first thing that you want to look at is the students list and check if you are here and if you are not here uh, why uh, so tell us and uh, contact the coordination uh, basically, this is the index of uh, the students of this year, uh, but I want to show you what we are talking about, so I will go to the index of the students from last year and quickly show you two of their uh, documentation websites. I think I have the links uh, here. Okay, this is uh, Jessica. So the first page of her website basically describes what she did during Fabricademy. Of course, this is a website updated during uh, the whole semester, so you will you could have something like this. And then she tells us about what she who she is, what she studies, and what she did before uh, Fabricademy. Uh, uh, any uh, assignment that she developed during the year is documented in the assignment page. For example, we can check what she wrote for this week. And uh, she started just with some inspiration and their goals for the class and uh, some ideas about the documentation. Now, it's not, not everything is loading. And I show you another example of a nice student uh, website, uh, Bediana, also from last year. And she basically made a very formal profile of her work and uh, who she is, uh, etc. I invite you to look at these uh, websites uh, because these are uh, very well done and also the content they provide is uh, very interesting. Uh, starting from the um, from the class archive, uh, you already can find a small tutorial that I prepared for you, and it's a documentation tutorial. Uh, it's basically a little book that tells you uh, how to edit and create uh, your own website. For time reasons, I won't go. Uh, into the detail of all uh, 
the process I will just to show you quickly uh, how it's your website now and uh, I can just go to the this year's student list and get the first one so this is your website now and uh, as you see this website is already populated so if you click on your name you already find this template uh, because uh, it's a lot of work doing Fabricademy and I think uh, uh, you spend your time better uh, writing the documentation writing, rather than formatting a website. What you want to know about this uh, website is that this is uh, generated every time uh, you make an edit to your project website repository. So uh, if you click on this uh, link that you find on the top right of your website, you will be forwarded uh, to this site, which is called GitLab. Uh, this is our uh, uh, repository uh, for all the academic classes. And if you follow the tutorial that I, I wrote, that I just pointed you to, uh, you will have all the, the information to edit your website here. I just want to show you that there is a structure, so you have a docs folder, and inside this doc folder you find, for example, this index.md, and this index.md is the content of the home page of your website. This is all well described uh, in, the, in the tutorial, and so I will leave this uh, to you. Uh, but in case you have any questions of, uh, or any, any issues, you just can uh, uh, write me and I will support you. You can write to it at fabacademy.org, that is the support email address for all the uh, services of the, uh, of the Fab Academy and also the Textile Academy. And the other important link, I'm going fast because we don't have a lot of time, but the other important link is the student's handbook. And this is the basically our uh, uh, little guide that explains you for each class uh, how the, the academy works, how the evaluation works, how the single uh, individual classes, uh, what is their... Uh, their program, which are their assessment criteria. Now this introduces another important part. So you will write a documentation and this documentation will be used, uh, of course, to share your work with the rest of the community, but also to be evaluated uh, at the end of the, the semester uh, in order to get the Fabricademy diploma. To get this diploma, basically you have to fulfill all the criteria that are defined uh, in this page of the handbook and that basically define what we expect you to learn during the class, uh, which kind of activities we, we expect you uh, to, to learn and to perform during the class. And class by class, you, you, you will see that you have a student checklist that tells you uh, what to do during this week. In this case, for example, the first week, the assignment is to build your documentation website, upload the documentation, uh, learn how to edit your website or upload images, uh, uh, files, videos, etc. And for every other class, we have a number of uh, learning outcomes that define, uh, let's say, uh, how your work for this week is fulfilling uh, criteria that we believe should be in the projects for, uh, for each uh, topic. Uh, so this is your best friend during the development of the class because here you know exactly what to do uh, for each week. And finally, uh, we have an evaluation platform. So you will have uh, an account for your student evaluation. Uh, which is not ready yet. We will provide you this in a couple of weeks. Uh, in this uh, student evaluation platform, here is the manual. Basically, you will have access for each week to the, uh, all the criteria that are shown in the handbook. 
uh, shown as sliders, so in a percentage from zero to 100%. And uh, you will have also a way of communicating, checking your checklist and communicating with your local instructor that is doing your local evaluation. So your local instructor will watch uh, your work in the lab, but will also evaluate your documentation uh, in a first round of local evaluations. This process basically should start as early as possible. We will make sure that it will start in the first couple of weeks, but will also be followed by a second evaluation, which will, which will be carried out by the Global Fabricate meeting, uh, which are independent, many of the remote instructors of, uh, or experts uh, from the previous year of the Fabricademy that will uh, evaluate your work again uh, based only on your documentation. So what you will write in the documentation is what uh, we will accept as valid for your evaluation and for your graduation. Uh, this part will come later, but you, you already know how it works. And I think uh, this is it. Also, we have a Slack channel, textileacademy.slack.com. I don't know if I'm logged in right now, uh, but you will be given access uh, to this uh, too. Actually, this is the, uh, the old channel uh, with uh, questions by the students and uh, interesting news. And this is uh, like, like our real-time channel for chatting with the students, asking questions, and also for you to communicate between uh, yourselves uh, during the class. And finally, we have on uh, Vimeo, of course, uh, we have our uh, uh, Fabricating channel. And uh, in this channel, you will find the recorded videos of this of each class. We usually uh, publish them uh, a couple of days after they are recorded, but I mean, you will see here not only the classes, but also like the final presentations uh, or stories by alumni. And uh, it's a, there is a lot of content. Of, of course, all the classes from the previous years are recorded. So if you, in case you want to watch a video before uh, uh, we start, uh, you, you can access this channel. And I think this is it. Are you still with me? Yes, we're still with you. So if you have any questions, I, I will appear now. If you have any questions, you can just uh, ask me now or uh, simply no, contact me. I don't I know anything about uh, programming and making web pages and GitLab and things like that. What do I do now? <laughs> you go to class.textileacademy.org and you go read my tutorial page by page. I tried to keep it, uh, I had uh, other tutorials, but I rewrote it uh, so it's uh, clearer and simpler. And you find the animated GIFs for all the things. But I, I, I mean, this is not uh, like high school. So this is an high level course. So we expect you to be able to cope with technology and to uh, learn new things fast. So I think it's an interesting uh, assignment for those that never created the website. Uh, and uh, if instead you are comfortable with it, you just edit the one that I provided you and add interesting content. I mean, the fo our co focus is on content, not on technology. So the technology we use is, uh, allows you to focus on that rather than on presentation. Of course, if you have, are a web wizard and want to make a fancy, uh, super uh, interactive website, you are very welcome. I can give you directions, but uh, it's pointless to spend a week on uh, in something that you don't really need. Work on the content, focus on your research, and plan the work that you want to do 
uh, during the next six months uh, based on the inspiration you got uh, today. And I have another question. Now I am trying to put a video in the, in the page and it doesn't work. What do I do? You link the videos first from YouTube or Vimeo and you can do just do this following the, the tutorial in the book. It's already there. Uh, GitLab has this uh, tweak, uh, uh, this, this bizarre bug that doesn't show the video in the preview when you edit the files, but they are shown when you publish the site. So the site is published uh, correctly, but the GitLab preview doesn't show you the video, but it's written also this in the tutorial. Every page that you will find in your example website has two videos embedded in, in the bottom. So you see how it's done. You just need to copy the different embed code for your video according to the instructions uh, over that, and it will work fine. And I added the uh, pictures in my website, but the, my website is not loading. Why? <laughs> Go to the troubleshooting uh, section of the guide. <laughs> Do not bother you. There yeah, is no, there is a troubleshooting uh, section in the guide that, <laughs> exactly. that tells you the reasons why your site might not be published. But I want to stress this: like we need to, we are on a shared environment, so we have uh, uh, we host the website uh, with, along with uh, many other services. So we have a reserved quantity of disk space available for each student, which is half a gigabyte, which is more than enough to publish probably half of Wikipedia. So you can publish your website there. And if you want to upload pictures, uh, files, it's fine until they don't, uh, they are not huge. Like for example, an image can be 150 kilobytes and work really well on the web and shouldn't be the raw image that you take from your phone or from your camera because this is an image that it's useful for publishing in print or for doing photo editing but the poor guy that loads your website from india with one megabit internet connection will take five weeks to load that image and we want to be accessible no and also the poor guy that pays the bill for the internet connectivity for a mobile will be a face. You want to put 100 images in your site, you don't put them one megabyte, that's it. Can I ask something? Could you please maybe walk them through how they're going to uh, log in into the GitLab with passwords and fablabs.io? No, there is no fablabs.io. Every student received an email to the today, in the beginning of the class, that I created all the student uh, usernames with a link to reset their password. So you will just go there, click this email and set your password. And then you log in with your email address and the password. And uh, okay. yes. It goes, to, yeah, it doesn't let them reset. It doesn't ask uh, that password. It goes straight to the same page that you were showing us before with our name but it doesn't okay we, we we do the bugging offline for this i will check i just created them during the class so that might not be something. no no but it might be we are doing something also not correct okay but the the point is that you already have all an account and you can start documenting my only concern is those that don't have don't show in the student list should uh, ask themselves why and also tell us uh, <laughs> so we we can we can update the student list and create accounts yeah. okay so it could be maybe you are missing some documents signed or some administrative issue and so just contact the coordination and it should be sorted out and i'm okay thank you Fiore. So I'm wondering, is the assignment for next week, week clear to no. all of you? <laughs> so what do I have to do? <laughs> <laughs> 
So you have now one week of time to explore all of the beautiful tools and tutorials that Fiora has created for you and start creating your own, personalizing your own web page, telling us who you are, where you're from, what your background is, because remember that whoever is looking at your work is not talking to you. They have no idea who you are. And this is actually very important to give also a look and feeling. And you can do this in many ways. So do go through all of the other documentations. You can be more visual, more systematic, more structured. This is all up to you. Our brains function in completely different ways. What is important is that we document the process with which we came to these points, all of the files and techniques. So for this week, it's really just exploring um, the context of this program and how to document. And if you find out anything amazing that you have not seen in any other page, you should document also that. I have a question. Uh, could it be possible that we as instructors uh, have access to the um... GitHub in order to answer the, the questions or help the students to to see if we can yeah help them to work in the Mac. Also, I think so. I mean, uh, the projects are public. You can uh, the same. No, you know, but I mean, in the in order to edit the the website because in last ah year the website ah yeah, yeah 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 sure sure. Thank you. I know what you mean. <laughs> We've gone through that all of us. <laughs> and then you find out that if something doesn't work, first look at your um, dots and lines anywhere in your code. You might have missed one. <laughs> so I also see a student, uh, students that we didn't uh, introduce uh, before. And uh, it would be nice uh, to say hi to the rest of the group of people. So I see uh, Zaya's uh, makerspace, so I imagine that it is Mahaver there, and also uh, Fabla Chardigan. Can you uh, introduce uh, and say bye to the people? You want to introduce? Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mahavir uh, from Zio's makerspace. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and now, uh, before we introduce, actually, we, we are married now. <laughs> That's how she's introducing ourselves. Yeah. But, uh, so we were there last year. Thank, Thank you, you, Cecilia. We were there last year as well, and my new wife managed to complete it, and I didn't manage to complete it. So she has one up. She's already one up on me in our happy married life. So this year I'll be continuing uh, majorly because I was satisfied with my own work last year. And yeah, that's this year we are collaborating with a lot of institutes to offer a Fabric Academy, and we are hoping for a, a good turnout next year. And uh, we are planning as for that. And we are open for any uh, questions or inputs from new students, and we wish you all the very best. Great. Wish me best too. Congratulations on your wedding, wow. and uh, we hope to see you more. Uh, involved in the program and mm -hmm. Fabla Chartiga, the same, no? That's, oh, that's, that's yeah. us. We are just recording the lecture yeah. for tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> it's actually very <laughs> late for the conference, so we're recording it so we can do it in the morning tomorrow for them. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that uh, bye. Uh, I think that uh, we are uh, concluding for today. Uh, if the, there are any questions? I will stop recording.